today we're kicking off the third monthly Longevity Biotech Association Roundtable. Uh, I'm James Pyer from Cambrian Bio, and I'm pleased to be joined by Celine Hulua, who is the CEO of Loyal. Um, Celine and I have been friends for, or I guess, a long time now as we've kind of taken really interesting and I think different paths towards the long-term eventual goal of creating a drug that enhan enhances human health span. And so the purpose of today's roundtable discussion, which will start out as a conversation just between me and Celine, but then we have some other folks on the uh, on the call as well, who will be able to pop in and ask questions a bit later down the line, is to really explore what the investment thesis in uh, human primary prevention clinical trials is today, and how different groups are taking um, orthogonal, but but nearer term approaches to to get to those human prevention trials. Um, and so I thought it would be an interesting one. The, the topic that I gave, the kind of flashy topic for this conversation is racing to a longevity trial where, you know, the, the artificial framework is, uh, I think Loyal has a really interesting and I think different business model than a lot of other folks in this industry. And and I want to kind of compare and contrast some of the uh, the strengths, but then also the risks of that business model versus, let's call it the more traditional, what I call the stepping stone indication, the disease first human medicines business mm -hmm. model, which is the one that Cambrian and some others are using. And like, you know, maybe have an interesting sort of discussion with a bit of debate uh, around that. So Celine, thanks for taking some time and I'd hand it over to you to maybe introduce yourself and, and a bit about Loyal. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Um, I, I was thinking about whether or not to make a joke that I think we've been friends for eight years now, yet you still can't pronounce my last name. Oh my it's gosh. Okay. What, wait, how do, how do I pronounce it properly? Hollywa. Hollywood. Literally nobody can. I couldn't spell oh my, my full name until I was in middle school <laughs> because it's, it's half German, half Moroccan. And so if you can spell or have the instinct for the spelling or pronunciation of one half, you screw up the other half royally. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I had to rip you on that one. <laughs> I, I accept and apologize. No, you don't need to. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and excited. It, it's, it's really fun to think about the, the, the way I at a high level kind of think about the field is, you know, aging and longevity biotech is going to be way larger than any you know, Cambrian, Loyal, any one company in the space. It's, I think, if we are successful, we being an industry is successful, it's going to be as large or larger than oncology and neurodegenerative disorders one day. So it's really more about how do we catalyze this industry, uh, facilitate it, and then, you know, how do we as a company obviously benefit from that? Um, and push forward and have a have a large stake in that going forward, both scientifically, influentially, uh, and of course, from a revenue standpoint too. Um, so I, I run Loyal. I'm the founder and CEO. I started end of 2019. Uh, we're about a three-year-old company, about 60 people, raised about 60 million to date. And the goal of the company is to get the first ever drug approved for lifespan extension, for health span extension, literally on a label, you know, FDA approved in dogs. And so really our goal is to go dogs first to facilitate the field. Um, and I came to this thesis, um, honestly, out of a frustration, out, out of what I felt like was a huge, huge hurdles to going humans first. Um, at least at the time, um, there were, uh, as I'm aware, no, no companies that were explicitly developing drugs for health span extension, for aging, for lifespan extension. They were all going by a proxy indications, some of which were very clever approaches like Restore Bio um, that obviously have really kind of pushed forward to industry. But I was really passionate and my thesis has always been that if you get a drug approved for lifespan extension, now this would be a catalyst to kind of reframe how the average American, how the average individual thinks about the problem because the average person has never even considered this fact, or if they have been exposed to the longevity industry, it's more on the super controversial side of you know, immortality, thousand year lifespans, and all these ideas that actually hide what I think aging drugs actually are, which is multi-morbidity preventative medicine. Um, so our, happy to dive in wherever interesting, but our high level thesis is that by developing drugs for dog lifespan extension, there's a billion dollar company to be built, a lot of revenue to be had, but also what we learn in dogs will give us an advantage both from a regulatory standpoint and a biological standpoint to know what might be translationally relevant to people too. Hmm. So I think the most interesting part for me to start on this is that there's a few 
a few immediate topics that come up because of the dogs first approach. And I think the most obvious one to ask is what will make getting this, you know, on the label health span extension or multimorbidity prevention label in dogs, what makes it easier than doing it in humans first? Yeah. So there's a couple of things, but fundamentally it comes down to the fact that dogs live shorter lives. The FDA, um, if, from you know my understanding, to be clear, we interact with veterinary FDA, not human FDA, but they're not necessarily against the, you know, they don't hate the aging field or hate the idea of longevity or whatever. It's not emotional. It's purely, it's practical, right? How do you prove that your drug has an impact on your endpoint of interest? And how do you prove that the risk reward ratio is sufficient to ethically justify a clinical study? Uh, it's very hard to do that. Uh, I mean, if I gave you an aging drug today that if it's an NC has, you know, non-negligible uh, safety risks to your health to prevent a disease that you may or may not develop in 20, 30, 40 years from now, that's a very hard proposition for any regulatory body, which again, the FDA exists first and foremost to protect uh, American citizens um, or the American populace from unsafe drugs. And that's a lot of its expansion was around a drug, uh, was due to a drug that wasn't very safe, um, causing a lot of uh, issues in, in, in Europe to say the least. So in dogs, you don't have as much of that problem because dogs live anywhere from you know, seven to eight years in the case of a Great Dane to maybe 16 to 18 in a Chihuahua. Uh, the smaller live, uh, breed dogs do live a long time, but it's still much more reasonable to run a study where you can see the movement of that. Um, you can also see the, the movement of biological aging in a dog in about six months, which is something, something we've replicated a couple of times now. And then most importantly, and really the original thesis of the company was the fact that you have this 2X differential in dog lifespan. So the bigger a dog is, the shorter their lifespan is, is actually a very strong inverse linear correlation. And at the extremities, the 2X differential, and the, you don't see this in people, right? You don't see that tall people are living much shorter lives uh, or vice versa. We you know, might see some differential, but nowhere near a 2X differential. And the thesis of Loyal and the thesis that we really founded around is that actually when we were selectively breeding dogs for the phenotypes we wanted, um, you know, friendliness, the ability to retrieve, defense, whatever it was, when people historically selectively bred dogs for size, they accidentally gave them an accelerated aging disorder. Um, and so that was a really nice hook because it allowed us to connect two things, um, longevity and lifespan, and that being relevant to test a drug for, but also something that the FDA already understood, which is genetically associated uh, canine diseases due to historical inbreeding. I mean, every dog breed has some sort of associate, genetically associated disease. Uh, German Shepherds get hip dysplasia. Goldens have two forms of cancer that they predominantly die of. Bradycephalic dogs, the dogs that have flat faces, have breathing issues. And so it, while it has not been historically defined by the field in this way, that big dogs living shorter lives is a disease for us, we felt like A, it was scientifically merited to have this hypothesis, but also two, that this was a really nice kind of stepping stone into having a discussion we wanted to have, which is a drug that was explicitly for aging instead of anything uh, proximal. Okay. So I think one of the parallel discussions that we're having on the human side, as we kind of digest this idea of like, all right, how do you run a multimorbidity prevention trial with a putative aging drug in humans has been the outcomes versus biomarkers debate. So something that, that you were just talking about now is like how challenging it would be. And I would agree with you, impossible to run a trial in, let's say, you know, humans in early middle age uh, who might you know, be getting a disease 20, 30, 40 years from now. Um, and so if you go back and look at, for example, how the statins were approved, they were all started in high risk individuals of advanced age, right? People mm -hmm. with high cholesterol. So there's like biomarker inclusion criteria, um, plus, you know, the, the endpoints of those trials are all outcomes-based. How many cardiovascular events did they experience? So is what you're thinking with Loyal kind of a, a similar structure, an inclusion criteria that might mean just big dogs, right? This this aging risk factor, and then outcomes-based trials, like a, a multimorbidity event is a hit or mortality outcome is a hit, and then do it that way over a, you know, 
because of the lifespan uh, being so short, you could run it in like a two to three year time frame. Is that is that kind of the thesis that you're putting together? Yeah, so we haven't um, received protocol concurrence yet, but we have been in discussions with the FDA. So I can't speak too specifically about the design until we, if and when we get that concurrence. Uh, and for context, for uh, for those who don't know, uh, the idea of protocol concurrence is you agree with the FDA. Um, you know, if you run a study, you do the statistics in this way. It's powered in this way. These are the groups. Here's how you recruit, and you show statistical significance in your outcomes. This is the label claim you will get. So we've been in that process for you know over two years and really longer with the FDA. Um, so excited to kind of talk more specifically if and when we get that. Um, but at a high level, we so we are not using a surrogate biomarker based or a biomarker based approach. Um, one of the other theories we had, which I think has uh, proved fruitful, is. We wanted to link to things that were already independently valid. We really, I, the model has always been like, what hill are, are we going to die on? Die on that one specific hill. For us, it's lifespan and health span extension. And everything else, we just reference the existence. So for example, we are looking at health span. I think there are much better ways to look at health span than some of the tools that exist today. Um, I think there's, you know, novel functional endpoints that one could use, which is, I, I think, uh, we're still building our thesis on, you know, the, what a human study would look like, but I think functional will be very relevant. That's how we've, uh, you know, built up some of our preclinical canine uh, evidence to date. Um, but it's not anything we're doing in our study because we wanted to be able to say, look, you know, here's where the novelty is. Everything else, how are we quantifying health span? How are we quantifying frailty? These are existing validated tools. So you FDA don't have to work worry that there's some bias or that we've designed a tool that benefits us um, and, and, and include that in your assessment of our pivotal study. Um, the other nice thing is that mortality is actually the most objective endpoint there is, right? Mm -hmm. You're alive, you're dead. <laughs> so it's difficult for a multitude of reasons, predominantly the length of the study, um, but also um, how do you measure the cause of the mortality incident. You also have euthanasia that you have to think about in pets. So you don't have that natural kind of end stage and people euthanize at different points. People have very different medical access in the veterinary space. You know, here in the Bay Area, there's like, well, you can literally give your dog an MRI. Um, you're not going to be able to do that in, you know, most veterinary sites in the US. So you have to design a study that looks at the age-related diseases that are not developed in a dog that is consistent and not biased due to the types of vet or type of veterinary care that you get um, as a pet parent. You know, some for some people, if the dog seems slower, they will put them down at that point and they're not going to do diagnostic work and they can skew a study. Um, so that's all to say we actually have kept it very simple um, to avoid as much risk of um, a, a false fail is is how I think about it. So if the drug doesn't work, if it doesn't extend lifespan, obviously the drug the study is going to fail. It should fail if it doesn't work. Um, but otherwise, everything else is as objective as possible, as externally validated as possible, to minimize risk to us to the okay. study and to us. Yeah, very interesting. So I think that that's kind of like what the advantage in dogs is. And then the next kind of you know the sequela of that is. How does that dog study actually give you leverage to go into humans? And I think that there's two aspects here that I'd like to dive into, and then we can kind of figure out where we want to go from there. One that you mentioned in your introduction is sort of this mindset change mm -hmm. um, that you could stimulate. And I think one of the really impressive things for, for me about how I've been, you know, as a third party watching Loyal grow is just how you've catalyzed the interest of so many people all across the world in like who care about longevity in their pets, in dogs. Um, so I think how much, so that's kind of one aspect that that you have kind of outlined, and I'd love to double click into that a little bit. But then the, the second one, this is more like, you know, on this group, which is mostly a technical group's fascination is mm -hmm. from a technical and kind of clinical trial and regulatory level, like what is the barrier um, that you say, hey, we've got this drug, it works in dogs. Now, once that success happens, what's the next step and why does that become easier if you want to switch into humans? Yep. That's a great question. Um, so I'll, 
I think the way I would pull it down, the three categories would be what you talked about. So societal mindset, which benefits us if we go first, but it's not going to be, there's no moat to that. Um, so, you know, any um, halo, quote unquote, we create around aging will benefit everyone, which is the intention. Uh, two, it's biological. And then three, it's regulatory. Um, so to go on the mindset thing, uh, you, you covered it really well, right? It's how can we introduce this idea? Again, to us, it's like so obvious that there should be drugs that target aging, that lifespan extension should be the path by which you go, that health span extension would be a trillion dollar drug class, et cetera. But the, most people have never, ever heard of this. And, or if they've, again, if they've heard of it, they've heard about it in a negative context. The, the field has historically leaned on being controversial to get press. Um, which is a good strategy and is something that many fields like crypto is the same way, um, cryogenics has been the same way. So it's not necessarily uh, a negative on the field, but it does, there is a also, it has to become mainstream for something to get broad adoption. Um, so really what I've been trying to think about is like, how can we make this idea of aging and health span and lifespan extension of dogs super mainstream? Like the phrase I use is, you know, aging is boring, right? Like the idea of an aging drug should not be controversial. It should be something that everyone is like, well, yeah obviously, you know, like I want my dog to live longer and it not even be a question. And dogs first is really great for that because you don't get all the, the number one question I get whenever I have an interview is, well, how is this not going to further socioeconomic disparities? And does that just mean rich people are going to live longer and forever and then poor people are going to have less healthy lives? And I have a lot of like answers and thoughts on that. Yeah. But high level, we, we actually had, we actually had Andrew Scott on the last oh, cool. uh, the last roundtable that we did, and and Jim Mellon and Andrew Scott did a, a fairly nice deep dive into some of the socioeconomic factors yeah. and like, the economic implications of you know how you know it's almost the opposite case that if we do not enhance human health span, we face the a looming demographic uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. But that that's yeah. Andrew's uh, take on this and and one that I share. But yeah, so I, not. I agree with that. Yeah, age related ahead. disease treatments are some of the most expensive. I mean, the new CAR T's can be you know, $500,000 or more. I worked on um, ocular gene therapies, which wouldn't be relevant to this specific uh, class, of course, but we're kind of a proving point for a larger gene therapy based mm -hmm. interventions, million dollars a shot, um, which, you know, the COGS don't drive the entirety of that, of course, but it is the COGS are just tough. And it's again, there's a high willingness to pay so that they charge it. Um, so I do think. That that's a that's a challenge that aging field will always face. The nice thing about dogs is that it's pretty non-controversial that dogs are great and that them living a longer, healthier life would only be better for the world. Uh, and so pe even if people are questionable about us translating into people, they don't question what we do in dogs. And that really, really helps. Also, it's cute, this idea of you know building a farm brand that people love. It's just much because it's cash pay again, too. So it's not going to be some like disparity of access. We are really committed to having, you know, as much equality as possible in access to our drugs. Um, it, it just takes away a lot of these variables and makes it much easier to bring an idea. And I think that's important for building a brand, but I think it's also important because there's kind of, you know, two super high level ways to have regulatory change. One is, you know, you explicitly push for something as a company um, or as a group or, or in, in, of individuals. But that's extremely expensive and extremely challenging. And I personally don't have the capital to hire a, a lobbying firm. The other societal push and societal pressure. And so I'm really, I, I don't know, but my thesis is that societal pressure, you know, people can buy an aging drug for their dog and be like, what the fuck? Why can't I buy this for my grandma? Um, and again, that won't just benefit loyal, that'll benefit everyone, but that's that's right. Like it, that should be the case. If the aging field takes off, you know, we're only going to have a larger TAM. You're only going to have a larger TAM. You're only going to have an easier time getting funding for what you're doing. Same for me. It's, there will be a time when it becomes a little bit more zero sum, but it's not there now. Yeah, um, it's actually part of the reason that we wanted to create this LBA group is that more so than any other industry that I've ever touched, it feels like, you know, a rising tide will lift all boats kind of situation. And also the tide, uh, to keep your metaphor, if the tide goes out, it hurts all of us because mm -hmm. people are still really on the fence about this idea. Um, that's something that, you know, I wear on my shoulders pretty heavily. I'm sure you do too. If loyal fails, even for reasons that are totally justifiable, and even though our biology is very specific, you know, uh, as far as I know, completely ir irrelevant to the biology that you're chasing, it's going to be, it's going to impact all of us. Right. We've seen that historically with, you know, some of the trials that failed and then search race back in the day and all of that. 
So there's a really high bar for quality in this field, again, until it's more resilient. Um, but anyhow, that's the mindset side. The next side is regulatory. So what we do in dogs is not one-to-one -one or at all directly translates to different parts of the FDA. Um, they do communicate, of course, um, specifically because we are bounded by uh, specific federal laws of the FDA that are written in that um, even if the FDA like wants to work with you, if it doesn't fit into that, they just, they can't change anything about it. But in general, they are separate. But the benefit does come from the fact that we, I, I, there are certain, there's the things that are written in the book of like what you need to show to get a drug approved, right? CMC safety, uh, CMC safety efficacy. But then there's also the soft aspects of what you need to show. So like one of our original theses is that A, we needed to start with something that was a, a closer jump to what they understood. So again, genetically associated diseases in dogs. And the second thing is we had to minimize the risk of embarrassment. And we've impacted this in two ways. One, safety. The safety, the safety profile in LOI 1, um, as demonstrated by other groups, so not us, which is also important, is uh, up to 100x. Uh, you only need to show 135x and a 5x can have issues, right? And we have way, way higher than that. Um, for LOI 2, our second drug program, it's about 50x. And again, there's you know significant talks of 50x, but it's it, it gives that independent confidence that this might not work, the drug might fail. Um, nobody will know until we do this, the study, but there's a minimal risk of embarrassment of some somebody at the FDA putting their neck out on the line to expand out their interpretation of the legislation to allow us to do what we want to do. And that was, again, that's not written into the rules anywhere, but that was, we, again, that was a hypothesis coming in. I think it's something we've proven that it's, uh, or at least proven sufficiently for us that that was really relevant. Um, and the same thing on the, also there was aspects of like ways we have to, had to change our claims language and all of that to fit into the legislation that um, was due in part to precedents that we don't know about because you don't know about sure. but when FDA makes one decision that precedent follows down everyone else they can't change a predetermined thing so we got a lot of context for you know what discussions has the FDA had previously what did we need to put in there to make sure and so again that's not one to one our dog our dog drug getting approved for aging in dogs is not going to at all impact human FDA, but it gave us a lot of learnings on how to approach that. Um, and I think we have a, I think we have a very similar thesis on how to approach the FDA. Um, but I think the aging fields had a little bit of a more different thesis. Um, and that, you know, it, there's no one way to do this, obviously, but I think we've at least showed a path that is relevant. And one of the things we're going to hopefully do in the new year is start seeing like, does this translate out? Like, does this theory translate out? And it might not, right? And that's fine. But we want to find out. Yeah, I think the the safety point is something that I like to harp on uh, again and again. Our our head of drug discovery, um, who who was at like AbbVie and GSK before, as he moved into this geroscience world, he looked at the kind of tox and safety profiles that we were looking at in our TPPs, right? So these are in our target product profiles across the whole pipeline, and and he was like, "Yep, we're we're elevating." For every specific disease that we're going into, we're elevating the normal requirements that would be needed for a standard TPP. And his uh, he's, he's a German guy, Georg Terstappen. And his yeah. uh, his framework for this is he's like, every drug must be safe as milk, which is like a, a German phrase. But anyways. Um, Unless you're lactose intolerant. <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, and in the third... other piece, uh, before we get there, I'm, I'm curious okay. about one other piece of this regulatory approach as we think about what the right... Um, framing of the right drug and running the right trial, kind of making the field acceptable by making it boring uh, idea is a, a modality question. So, so how do you feel about biologics versus nucleotides versus small organic molecules as the first drugs that are going to be able to make this primary prevention journey? Yeah, so we, well, this, there's a couple of variables. One of the variables here that's relevant to pets that isn't going to be relevant to humans, it's just the COGS have to be really, really good because it's cash pay. LOI2, if it gets approved, will be, we don't know the final pricing, but somewhere between 30 to 50 a month, maybe a little bit more. Um, it's obviously a small molecule, which is what allows us to price it at that point. Uh, we couldn't really do 
uh, there's a couple of groups working on gene therapy. I, I, I think it's relatively unlikely to be able to get that at, at, at a COG standpoint that's relevant. But if I take that out of the, the equation and how I think about it more broadly, so our first drug is actually not a small molecule, um, it's a, which makes it a total pain in the ass to manufacture. Um, so we've definitely paid for that. Um, but it was, again, it was intentional because we wanted something that what the obvious kind of class risk of small molecules is they can have on-target safety, but also off-target safety. And off-target safety is really hard to predict unless you have long-term data. There's also interaction variables or something that you need to think about because it can, um, it can, um, it can interact with like if they had gone to an antibiotic later or something like that versus a drug like a, uh, a biologic or another type of, you know, larger molecule, uh, of course can have like immune issues and whatnot, but at a high level, you're mostly going to have that on target safety issue. Um, and that's that it is again, minimizes some of the variables. So that's why Loy one has, you know, both have high safety margins, but Loy one has like such a higher safety margin is because of the type of drug that it is. Um, conversely, I'm definitely skeptical of the approaches that are complex. Like I think the first drugs need to be simple. That means we're not going to maximize for efficacy, but it doesn't matter. Like it, it, it matters is to once somebody has forged that path, then you can stack on, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't think we could have started with Loy too, even though it's better margin, you know, it's gonna have a larger TAM, all of that, because we needed to like first use Loy one to get through it. Um, so I'm personally like scientifically it's interesting. I'm personally pretty skeptical of the mechanisms and modalities that people are targeting that don't have simplicity as a core value. Okay. Thanks for for going into that. And then I uh, interrupted your part three before we open up for questions. Yeah. So the last thing I'll say is, so on the what, reason why kind of dog can solve it, you know, of course it's biological, right? So I didn't invent this thesis. I didn't invent the One Health thesis. This idea that dogs are one of the best models of human aging, that dogs have co-evolved with a shared environment with us for tens of thousands of years. They develop the same age-related diseases we do at approximately the same time in our lifespan. Uh, and most importantly, to develop them naturally. Right, so we're not inducing a dog will get dementia, a dog will get uh, various forms of cancer. Uh, they get, you know, breast cancer, for example, many other age-related, and of course, non-age-related forms. They get osteoarthritis, um, they get ocular disorders, and they develop them over time. And so that means that it is again not one-to-one. -one. That's something that you know treats, uh, you know, a, a canine dementia would also treat human dementia but it at least reflects the biology better because it's it's not something that we've induced in a lab in an animal that you know is extremely inbred and whatnot. It's something that this, this complex organism has developed independently and also has an environmental drivers. Environmental drivers are really relevant to aging as, as we all know. Um, a mouse does not have to smell smog or doesn't have pollutants in the air. And so while we, it's extremely hard to understand what the exact, you know, order of magnitude or driving aspect of that is to have an animal that at least, you know, shares an environment with us, um, that shares a diet with us in some ways, at least gives, it, it moves us closer to the, to the target. And so again, it's not one-to-one, -one, but if something does successfully extend lifespan and health span in dogs, that's a pretty compelling data package to then go forward and A, you know, warrant the investment um, in doing the human work, but also, you know, potentially do the small molecule discovery or whatever drug discovery around that target as a potential way to push it forward. Um, and so our first two drugs um, we've been kind of developing at Law since 2020, the third drug that we're currently in process of hopefully closing a deal for is uh, in license from a, or is in progress of being in license from public biopharma. And the, one of the reasons they want to work with us uh, was because they want the canine data to validate or give data towards the expansion of their pa uh, platform beyond the kind of niche orphan indication they're going for today. So we got it for, real. I, I would say the number, but they're public, so I shouldn't. Uh, but we got it for like a pretty damn low upfront because for them, it's really more, you know, it's free preclinical research for them and something that they wouldn't be able to expand out. And that's going to be a huge advantage, I think, for the aging field in general, because it's not like the pharmas or these other companies have translational aging groups. 
Um, it's really only something that aging companies have. So how can you kind of take advantage of that? And that's a pattern that we've seen replicated at least two to three times now where we've got, you know, outsized interest from larger companies because they want the data that we're able to create and kind of the competency that we've built in-house. Really cool. Yeah. The, the last thing that I'll say before we kind of go into the question side of it is that you mentioned something there, which I think does not get repeated enough within this community, which is around growing an investment thesis for doing these long and difficult trials, right? Um, to your point earlier about the FDA being overall quite open to being able to run studies, we have Nir on the call, right, who who really took one of the pioneering steps in getting the FDA to give the thumbs up on the, the design for TAME, which is as a multimorbidity prevention study. Um, so like, if any company wanted to, they could take a drug that passed, uh, you know, preclinical tox and, and efficacy hurdles and go straight into a primary prevention trial as a phase two. Um, the, the reason that companies don't do that is an investment thesis risk reward decision more so than a, oh, you know, it's not a regulatory burden. It's not that you are not allowed to run this trial. And so one of the, the fascinating things for me coming from either direction, right, either this uh, sort of dog's first path that you've described or the orphan or chronic disease, specific disease indication first path, both of those I see as kind of investment de-risking aspects that mm -hmm. that can justify, hey, now that we've already got something valuable, right? You create something and it's a billion plus dollar product. Now carving off, whether it's 50 or 100 million to run a big long study from that thing that's already got a massively positive NPV becomes a much easier pill to swallow than asking for 50, 100 million dollars, whatever it's going to take, sight unseen to go take this brand new shot on goal. And I think that's that's the interesting union for me of these two different business models that mm -hmm. uh, that I think are characterizing the field. Uh, cool. Jane, uh, this, Nier, this go ahead. Nier. I'm sorry, I just stepped out of a, of a loud cafe, as you noticed before. My son is graduating, so I have, I have, to, I have to be out in 10 minutes. But I, I, I wanted to say several things. First of all, th thank you very much. That, that's great. That's part of the way. I, I, I was on the first grant that looked at from the NIH at, the, at dogs as a model of human aging. And, and I was there to promote the, the therapy. And this is just terrific that it's already on, on the biotech level. There, one thing, so I have a question, and really the question is related to endpoint of mortality. And this is the point I'm, I, I want to make here and I made before. You're talking about dogs that be, because they are hybrid, because they're in, inbred, sorry. <laughs> Because they're inbred, uh, they are more likely to have homozygosities that will uh, bring diseases. And and um, and and if if you're saying it's between nine and seventy years, it's like taking people um, eighty and forty years old, right? At the same, one of the reasons we start late is because we don't want strong genetic influence on our study. So if you're using mortality, A, people can argue, you know, this, this, this was a specific mortality. Or show us that it's not a specific mortality that uh, had an effect. And, um, and but you, you know, so this is mainly my question, but, you know, we want to succeed on one hand. Uh, we, we don't want to kill anyone on one hand and just succeed. And I'm just wondering if you're setting a little, because, because your genetics, choosing dogs that are dying out because genetics, the genetics might be stronger than the gerotherapy. That, that's, I guess, my point. So, so if, I, if I could, maybe, Celine, if you want to jump in. I, I couldn't really understand that. Yeah, <laughs> I admit. yeah sorry, Nir, it, it's not a perfect... Uh, a perfect sound, but luckily I've got the giant headphones on, so I was able to like you know s sonar operator tune in on that. If I'm if I can reframe the question slightly, uh, or, or restate it, Celine, you talked about how let's say Great Danes uh, age out and die in that kind of like seven eight year time frame, and so 
what I heard from Nir just now is that one of the things that they were worried about avoiding is saying, oh, hey, this is a, an, a person with a genetic predisposition, let's say to cardiovascular disease or to a specific type of cancer. And that by coming in with a gerotherapeutic that you may prevent or influence that genetic abnormality and that may be different mechanistically oh, yeah. from slowing from slowing aging and slowing those yeah. fundamental mechanisms. And so I wonder if the appropriate thing to respond to here is like, you know, is there a, a risk that fast aging in dogs looks different than aging generally because it is this increased mortality risk? And like, is that something you guys are thinking about or optimizing around? Yeah, that was the piece. Right. Yes, yeah, so that was very intentional. I, I agree 100%. So uh, Loy won the big dog short lifespan drug, I don't think is something that's going to be supporting, uh, you know, translational relevancy into people um, for this exact reason. Um, it's, um, I think it's like biologically interesting, right? But I don't think it's you're totally right. It is a, a phenotype of historical inbreeding and therefore very specific and very specifically driven around this mechanism of aging. But that was intentional. We wanted to have a, a really one, one of the things when I was starting Loyal, I would talk to pet parents and I, you know, I, I was trying to understand if people would want an aging drug for their dog. And, you know, that was the always like the aha moment, like, oh, yeah, you're right. Great Danes do live a really short life. People always assume that was inherent and not, and then I would be like, well, what, what if they could live longer? And they're like, oh, right. That is really weird that these, you know, Aussie shepherds and, you know, other dogs are living much longer. So it was intentional. I agree that program specifically, I don't think is going to translate into, uh, directly into people, um, or might not be like our first choice for translating directly into people. But it's, again, it's all about that stepwise. So our second drug program, LOI2, is not at all around any specific genetic mechanism of accelerated dog aging. It's for dogs of almost any size, uh, almost any breed who are already showing signs of aging. So again, similar to your, at a high level to your, your study design here. Um, and it's around uh, metabolic fitness. It's, it's not rapamycin or metformin, but like similar mechanism of action. And the important thing is we set the press, the regulatory precedent with our first drug, the big dog short lifespan drug, which now we are using for this drug that is a more broad aging mechanism. So yeah, I 100% agree. Really interesting. Okay, cool. So continuing to open up the uh, the floor, because I could keep peppering you with more questions, and I'm sure we could talk about this a lot longer than an hour, Celine. Uh, but is there anyone else in the group who wants to, to chime in to talk about anything else? Um, otherwise, I would get to ask Celine about biomarkers before we, uh, before we, we close out. Our thesis on that is evolving a lot. Um. <laughs> uh, ours too, actually. So, so, uh, but Oliver just hopped in. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. 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 Sorry. Um, I'm Oliver. I'm, I'm at a pyro, and so you know, each other. Um, I was actually gonna, I was I was going to ask a slightly different question because I, I you know I know we could we could go on about um you know biomarkers at endpoints. And I think that's a that's obviously a huge part of this, but. I kind of wanted to touch on, you know, how to, how do we incentivize um, companies and biotechs to kind of go down this route? If we're thinking about very long studies and you can't necessarily find the right biomarker, you're going to need to think about IP extension for a critical, almost like a, an independent class of compounds longer than the, maybe the 20 years that we think about as the kind of standard at the moment. And I'm thinking like, what, what's your take on how we go about incentivizing that and making that a reality? Yeah, it's hard. So that's one of the reasons we also started in Daleks is um, A, there's just not a robust generics market, uh, but 80% of dog drugs don't have a generic um, and successful dog drugs like HeartGuard, it's, you know, it's ivermectin. It's been, you know, generic for decades uh, and it still is growing sales year over year. It's about, I think, 400 million approximately worldwide right now. Um, and then most importantly, the veterinary FDA, when you have, um, a novel API uh, approved uh, in dogs for a, a new use case, they give you uh, a, a huge amount of uh, federal mandated exclusivity. And that was really important because even if you do have core IP um, around something that's not the, the NCE, it's you have to uh, enforce it. And, you know, good, good luck as a small company <laughs> enforcing a manufacturing 
or formulation patent or anything like that. You just like don't want to go down that. Uh, as far as it goes in people, uh, I don't know if I have an answer, honestly. It's we it's it's really one of the things we've been struggling with the most because it feels like you're being pulled in all these different ways. Like we really want to take our thesis of what we've done in dogs going straight for lifespan and health span into people. But then we know the safety aspect is really important. We're also not a discovery company. We don't do drug development. We, I really think of it as more of a translation company. So then we need to bring something in, but in the patent life, it's even shorter. And like, are those safety studies really relevant to what we've done? And then I don't know, is like the, the, the short and long of it. I don't know how you fix that. I can, I can also comment a little bit on the human side, yeah. because I think this is something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, but Oliver, like it's, it's a huge challenge in the field and it's also an evolving one, right? I'm sure many of you guys know about the changes in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, that affect primarily small molecules that are shortening their patent life uh, from the time that they come in as new drugs, or at least put a cap on, on patent life. Whether that's going to really stick or not, as we move forward 10 plus years into the future, I think most, most people that I've talked to are actually pretty sure that we don't have to over-optimize about those changes today, but it, it frames the question really nicely, which is that what patent lifespans, short patent lifespans do is they make it harder to do indication expansion, right? That makes it harder to go from disease A to disease mm -hmm. A plus B for any type of drug. And so the interesting thing here is that from our perspective, none of the trials that we're proposing to do are ever going to be so long to actually exceed that 20 year patent lifespan type thing, right? You, that's just a non-starter for drug development generally. Um, but coming back to the topic of like an investment thesis angle of this, one of the key aspects for us is when do you get to an inflection point where you actually switch from the, let's call it the disease focused human trials to the prevention focused human trials. And I think it can come at two different phases. It can come post phase two, or it can come post phase three. And the difference of those two, two pieces are often two to three years apart, which changes NPVs from negative to positive or the other way around. And, and so a fascinating thing for us is how do you gain enough conviction and the safety and on-target efficacy of a drug to start a phase two prevention proof of concept trial before our drug is approved, but after you've demonstrated that the drug is going to work. And, and I think that's, that's where a lot of my focus is on this investment thesis side of things. Does it work without that? Yes, but it's just less attractive and you have to rely more on thing, you know, you have to rely more on great pricing, uh, protecting generic competition in other ways, like Celine was talking about with formulation, with, with some of these other things. And so we put those considerations in place, but I also have a strong suspicion, and this is where I want to circle back to like the branding idea of this and like the, the sending a message and kind of convincing people that this is a good, is that there has been in the US and elsewhere, all of these healthy aging initiatives that have kicked up all over the place. And if we're truly on the cusp of being able to run trials and approve drugs that are multi-disease preventatives, I think these are the sorts of things that regulatory change can help not give the green light to, but help incentivize in a really strong way that changes that investment thesis math. And so you know, although no individual company is is hiring, you know, aging lobbyists yet, by the time that we fast forward four or five years, when these molecules are reaching those proof of concept, um, or even less, right, three years, by the time these molecules are reaching these proof of concept points, I imagine there's going to be a really robust discussion in multiple countries, including the U.S., but not necessarily led by the U.S., of how we're going to make these molecules happen. Yep. Yep. That's again, we are, uh, I'm not, I can't, shouldn't, won't say anything like definitive about the human stuff because we're still working through it internally. Um, but that's actually one of the things we're thinking about is not going us first and going somewhere. Again, it's all about this idea of incentive alignment. Where are the incentives aligned with you the most? 
Um, and then how can you use that to grease the wheels of what you're trying to do? Um, and I would, uh, I don't think the U.S. has as much incentive alignment as I think we all know, um, as for example, some of the single payer systems might. Um, and there's also some political stuff uh, you can pull on too. Like for example, you know, with Brexit and whatnot, one of the things we're interested in is MHRA. Um, with Brexit and whatnot, there's like a, they, a, the UK has this, I forgot what it's called, but something about extending the lifespan of the, the British population. And then they additionally kind of have this like subtle thing of wanting to show that Brexit was the right call, though, like not being via the EMA was the right call. Um, of course, you're not going to say that explicitly. Here's how you can like, you know, throw a poop in the face of, you know, the European regulators or whatever in the EU, but it is like a subtle thing that might like help accelerate um discussion so again i don't know we haven't had we've never had conversations with regulator in the context of human drugs because we're just not there yet but so we never think about our theses on that and how do we prove or disprove them cool well celine we're getting close to being out of time but i cool. hope this was a you know fun conversation for you i think really interesting from my perspective we we never get the opportunity to actually sit down and have like a focused hour long back and forth this is probably the the first time i've really heard yeah. the loyal <laughs> pitch just for me or like targeted at the question well, the questions the time, i, I see you I it's like i'm off of a red eye and i'm just exactly. like James, if you ask me anything about aging biology i'm gonna throw this cocktail at you <laughs> well awesome so Members of the group, thanks so much for uh, for listening in and particip and participating. Celine, again, thanks for dropping by, and uh, this was a fun time. Hope you have a good end of the year, and uh, yeah, happy New Year to everyone. And we'll do another one of these probably in January. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks.